Hello, friends, and welcome to This Day in Jack Benny. I'm John Henderson. This is not a regular episode of the Jack Benny program, but a bonus episode, a new project that I'm very excited about. And with me, I have a radio professional and my wife, Stephanie Henderson. Hello. Stephanie, you know that I love you. (laughs) And one of the things that I love doing with you is just hearing you read. You're an incredible reader. Aw, thank you. Even in the early days of our marriage, you would be willing to just sit and read books together with me. And by together, I mean you read and I listen. (laughs) (laughs) I like reading, so it works for me too. (laughs) And I like listening. Oh, perfect. (laughs) Which is one of the reasons I'm a Jack Benny fan. I love listening to things. So a few years ago when I started the podcast, I, I heard about an upcoming book. It was going to be called Jack Benny's Radio Comedy. Uh, The full title ended up being Jack Benny and the Golden Age of American Radio Comedy by Catherine H. Fuller Seeley. So it's been years since then. The book has come out, and I've actually gotten to know Kathy a little bit. And so I got the idea of turning it into an audiobook. I love listening to audiobooks. There's no audiobook for this book, and I thought it would be a great Patreon special to have you, Stephanie, reading the book. So the idea is uh, one out of the two Patreon episodes each month will feature a part of this fascinating book. Kathy has done such an amazing job looking specifically at Jack's radio career. Yes, and it's an enormous project. Actually, I had a chance to ask her how long it took to write the book. About 10 years. From 2007, when I said, gee, I'd like to write this book, but I had to learn everything about radio and everything about Jack Benny. I can't start writing until I've learned most everything. Well, the patrons will be able to listen to each chapter in its entirety as it comes out, and you can find a link to become a patron in the show notes or at thisdaybenny.com. So many people have asked for an audiobook version of this and hopefully a uh, lot of people will donate well let's get to the first chapter fantastic chapter one's my favorite chapter but every chapter is my favorite chapter so <laughs> enjoy the show jack benny and the golden age of american radio comedy by katherine h fuller seeley University of California Press. Copyright 2017. Read by Stephanie Henderson. Chapter 1. Becoming Benny. The development of Jack Benny's character-focused comedy for radio. Anticipation mixed with anxiety in the small glass-enclosed broadcasting studio installed in the old roof garden situated atop Broadway's New Amsterdam Theatre on Monday night, May 2, 1932. Beginning at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, the inaugural episode of Canada Dry Ginger Ale's half-hour radio program aired live, carried over a network of NBC Blue radio stations covering the eastern United States. The only audience members were representatives from the show's sponsor, advertising agency, and network. The program's concept and cast had been assembled for Canada Dry by NBC executive Bertha Brainerd as a new direction in sponsorship for the company, which had previously underwritten a dramatic and violent adventure series set in the Canadian Rockies. Canada Dry's advertising agency, N.W. Ayer and Son, billed the new show as 30 Minutes of Music and Quips, featuring six numbers played by New York band leader George Olson and his orchestra, and sung by his spouse, Siegfeld Follies star Ethel Chute. Already widely familiar to radio listeners, they were considered to be the main attraction of the show. The music would be interspersed with brief monologue segments performed by 38-year-old vaudeville veteran Jack Benny, who was introduced as that suave comedian, dry humorist, and famous master of ceremonies. 
In his first performance for Canada Dry, Benny told a series of jokes drawn from his well-honed stage routine, offering informal and genial self-deprecating comments on personal experiences, such as his Hollywood adventures, and the mediocrity of his girlfriend who posed for the before in before and after photos. By the conclusion of his fourth bi-weekly episode, Benny queasily realized he had used up nearly every monologue he had perfected over 15 years in vaudeville, and more broadcasts lay ahead of him. The new Canada Dry Show joined a rapidly increasing number of variety comedy programs on primetime network radio. While music had been the dominant program form of the previous five years, the entertainment trade press noted that comedy was growing as a less expensive option for sponsors weary of paying for high-priced orchestras and temperamental crooners. New shows in the 1932 season featured not only newcomer Jack Benny, but also other vaudevillians such as George Burns and Gracie Allen, George Jessel, Fred Allen, and Jack Pearl. Most, like Benny, were serving as MCs, short for MC, or Master of Ceremonies, for programs that mixed music, comedy, and advertising messages. The new entrants joined such already popular variety programs as those hosted by Rudy Valley for Fleischmann's Yeast, Ed Wynn for Texaco, and Eddie Cantor for Chase and Sanborn Coffee. The burgeoning popularity and financial success of commercial network radio was the one bright spot in an American economy sliding even further into the Great Depression. The unemployment rate was nearly 25 percent. Banks were closing left and right, and major industries had ground to a standstill. The entertainment world was hit especially hard. The majority of Broadway theaters were shuttered, major league baseball teams were playing in stadiums emptied of spectators, and vacation resorts appeared abandoned. Even the movie studios and picture palaces, which with the tremendous popularity of talkies had seemed immune to the economic crisis, now experienced a devastating downturn in business. The advertising business, also tremendously hard hit, found that clients who promoted their products on radio programs, especially in expensive consumer goods like tobacco, soap, and coffee, were seeing enormous sales gains. The speed and extent to which previously unknown performers like Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell had become nationally famous as Amos and Andy astonished entertainment veterans like Benny. The duo hadn't paid their dues by honing their act for years in theaters in the hinterlands. The gloating of the Pepsodent Company, whose toothpaste's previous meager sales skyrocketed when it began sponsoring the Amos and Andy program in 1929, were impossible to ignore. The pull of this growing entertainment medium, coupled with the push of a steeply declining opportunities on Broadway and in vaudeville due to the Depression, propelled the apprehensive Benny to try his hand in radio. Facing the daunting challenge of filling radio's unprecedented, ferocious demand for new content, Jack Benny initially struggled, but ultimately thrived in the new medium by developing new approaches to comedy. Benny and scriptwriter Harry Kahn began to craft a personality-based radio variety program drawing on Benny's vaudeville style and exploring new, to them, comic constructions of what contemporary critics termed character comedy and comedy situations. Experimenting as the program progressed from week to week, Benny and Khan expanded the narrative world of the show. They began developing comic identities for the major performers, orchestra leader, vocalist, and announcer, who stood around the microphone. Framing the group as workers putting on a radio show, Benny and Khan developed a personality for each of them that blended reality and fiction. The cast became a stable of recognizable quirky yet likable, continuing characters who could bounce off each other in informal exchanges in the studio or interact in situations from visiting the zoo or having dinner at a cast member's home to performing a parody of a popular new film. This variety greatly reduced Benny and Khan's reliance on pat monologues and standard joke-telling. What they developed was a forerunner of the situation comedy, a genre that would become much more prominent only 15 years later in radio and television broadcasts Casting in response to changing industrial practices and cultural norms. 
The duo could have created comic content for the program while leaving the MC as the star, a dominant figure who was fed straight lines by subordinates, or by making him a pleasantly bland father figure who rode herd over his workplace family. Instead, over a three- to four-year period, Benny and Con gradually transformed the Jack Benny persona. Writer and performer transitioned the role from the vaudeville character of a suave but self-deprecating monologist called by vaudeville critics the sleeky board joker to that of a vainglorious hapless fall guy a negative exemplar in historian Stephen Mintz's terms roundly and ritually roasted by his stable of zany stooges Benny and Khan turned the humor around Benny the MC became the butt not the mouthpiece of the acerbic comic lines The Jack Benny character of radio fame was their greatest creation. Even when their partnership unraveled in 1936, they had solidified Benny's place as the premier comedian in American radio broadcasting. Benny's Early Vaudeville Persona Jack Benny had already spent more than 20 years developing a vaudeville identity that brought him, if not immense stardom, solid success as a musician who had transitioned into a humorist who held a violin in one hand and a cigar in the other hand as he joked. Working as a single, who occasionally interacted with an assistant or other acts on the bill, Benny joined the expanding group of informal modern vaudeville hipsters whom we would know later as stand-up comics. Benny's twist to the genre involved creating a middle personality who was neither young nor old, wealthy nor poor. He was not loud or buffoonish, and he related to a homogenizing American audience as much more Anglo-American than Jewish or ethnic. He was a Midwestern variant of what vaudeville historians term the voice of the city. Variety critic Robert Landry later asserted that Jack Benny's stage manner had always seemed big time, even as it was perfected in local theater orchestras, military camp shows, and small-time vaudeville in the 1910s and early 1920s. Benny's style was subdued, his delivery one of the first examples of modern throwaway. He was poised, unhurried, seemingly effortless. He was not an ad-libber in the general sense. He prepared his stuff ahead, but changed it frequently, infused it with topical allusions. But he sounded ad-lib. Landry acknowledged that Benny's appeal was nevertheless somewhat limited because his act demanded too much attention and quiet to thrive either in noisy metropolitan nightclubs or among the rough-and-tumble milieu of vaudeville comics in the hinterlands. Reviews of Benny's routine in the early 1920s commended the reserve poise and personality of the monologist. Jack Benny, with his slow, easy patter, gets his crowd before he is well underway, commented a typical critic, who also mentioned the mediocrity of Benny's jokes. When he appeared in 1925 at New York's Palace Theatre, vaudeville's pinnacle, Billboard, praised Benny's droll delivery, but also labeled his routine as being a cross between the Frank Fay and Ben Bernie styles. Initially, as Ben K. Benny, his early stage name, in his act Jack Benny had superficially resembled deep-voiced band leader Ben Bernie, who grasped a fiddle and embellished the punchlines of his jokes with the catchphrase, Yowza, yowza! Bernie pressured the younger Benny to further modify his stage name to widen the perceived differences between them. The comparisons with Frank Fay continued, however, as Jack Benny unabashedly modeled his act on that of the well-known Irish-American comic. When Benny returned to the palace in April 1926, Variety complimented his excellent material and delivery, and his witty interplay with other performers. Stanley and Burns, the next act, came out early and asked to tell a story in Benny's spot. Benny's comments on the story were real funny. It was likable nonsense and a yell when Benny stopped them as he recognized it as a stag story. Benny regularly reenacted this routine with a female assistant whispering the salacious story in his ear so that he could flirtatiously dance between polite and sexually suggestive humor. When he incorporated it into a 1928 Vitaphone talkie short, a reviewer snarkily noted its similarities to a Frank Fay routine. They can find out who did it first. Frank Fay's urbane manner made him one of the most prominent and highest paid performers in vaudeville. He was one of the first to enact the MC role at the Palace and the nation's other top theaters. MCs had existed previously in minstrel shows, where they were called interlocutors, and in British music halls, where they were called compares. But Fay was said to have coined the term used in American vaudeville. 
The MC role was an outgrowth of Faye's innovative monologue act. Faye was one of the first stage comedians to eschew outlandish costumes, makeup, props, and broad physical shtick. The debonair, redhead, blue-eyed Faye dressed with impeccable, aristocratic style and moved with feminine grace. His timing and delivery were judged masterly. He was a boastful, big-city boulevardier with a breezy delivery and relatively restrained, soft-spoken demeanor that covered a rapier wit. Faye had a devastating ability to ad-lib insults that could destroy any heckler in the audience. A Life magazine profile described his cockiness and his conceit, the gentle smile, the quizzical lift of the eyebrows, the sweet voice, and then the dirty crack. Faye did not depend on strings of one-liners, but was a storyteller whose collection of whimsical and digressive tales were peopled with everyday individuals such as a family that obsessively saved string. Faye also sang stanzas of current songs like Tea for Two, stopping to dissect the absurdities of the lyrics along the way. He was elegant, suave, and superior, and made sure the audience knew it, through his wicked repartee and stinging quips, perfecting what a critic called an odd combination of humor and elegance. Faye's act was widely admired and copied by other comics, but offstage he was reviled for his bigotry, his alcoholism, and his massive ego. He called himself Frank Fay, the world's greatest comedian. Fellow comic Fred Allen once cracked, the last time I saw Fay, he was walking down Lover's Lane holding his own hand. Vaudeville acts had traditionally followed each other on stage in quick succession, identified in printed programs and by title cards placed on an easel at the side of the stage. But as attendance began to dwindle, vaudeville managers began to add an extra attraction a headliner such as Faye, Jack Benny, Julius Tannen, or George Jessel to present the show. The lead comic would appear not only in his own spot, but also throughout the bill, introducing the acts, interacting with or interrupting other performers, ad-libbing patter between the spots, and filling time if there were delays in the show. Some critics complained that this restructuring slowed the pace of the program, but the MC's performance made the disparate parts of the program seem more interconnected. Benny approached the MC role with a collaborative spirit, whereas Faye took the opportunity to turn the spotlight on himself and dominate the entire proceedings. Benny did borrow Faye's quiet charm, elegant manner, and womanly walk, but lacking his quick and inventive tongue replaced Faye's arrogance and ad-libbed put-downs with carefully crafted lines that sounded off the cuff and included subtle self-deprecation. Benny's opening line, which he used for years, was celebrated recalled vaudeville historian Maurice Zolotow. He would casually lope toward the center of the stage, tuck his violin under his arm, brush his hair back with his left hand, and inquire of the maestro, How is the show? Fine up to now, the maestro would reply. I'll fix that, Benny would say. Jack Benny rivaled Faye as one of the most frequent MCs at the palace between 1927 and 1931. Benny knows the palace and its audiences there as few others do, knowing what else they like besides actor and showbiz gags, noted a reviewer, who also voiced the concern mentioned by other critics that Benny struggled to find enough new material to last through repeated viewings. In Chicago, Jack Benny, who had acted as MC throughout the bill, was refreshingly humorous in his easy, graceful way, his chatter and violin playing both going over big. Vaudeville appeared increasingly unstable, however, so Benny experimented with other media. He appeared on Broadway in the 1927 Schubert Brothers review The Great Temptations, but felt that the predominance of blue humor did not complement his style. He also tried his hand at the movies, riding the wave of talent from vaudeville and the stage flowing to Hollywood with the coming of talkies. However, after playing a prominent role as the MC of MGM's Hollywood Review of 1929, his subsequent film roles and reviews of his performances were lackluster. Nevertheless, Benny kept trying to play up his film connections. In 1930 and 1931, Benny moved his act between films, vaudeville venues, and cavernous picture palaces, which began adding live stage acts to their movie shows to shore up attendance. Entertainment forms were converging, but Benny did not seem to fit comfortably into any of them. Playing the palace, Benny asked to be billed as the cinemaster of ceremonies. Skeptical critics expressed concern that Benny's work was too quiet and low-key to take command of 5,000 seats 
seat auditoriums. Although he did moderately well, devising some punchy additions to enlarge the scale of his act, Zouave soldiers, Japanese acrobats, comeuppance from the abrupt start of the film program on screen, a reviewer of his show at New York's Capitol Theater was still unconvinced. Benny is still the suave and clever MC, working all through the show to keep it pieced together effectively. His suaveness, then, tends to slowness, which hardly helps a presentation in a deluxer. The type of entertainment that goes is that which is served speedily and peppily. Benny was at a career crossroads as he wandered among various venues and media forms, trying to find the most advantageous platform for his particular skills. Worsening economic conditions of the early 1930s made the search more nerve-wracking. In 1932, radio and advertising executives like NBC's Brainerd, scanning the horizon for talent that might best adapt to broadcasting's needs, considered Jack Benny, although they were not initially very enthusiastic about him. Neither network brass nor sponsors' agencies were certain what styles and types of performers would work on the radio. Many preferred the loud brashness and quickness of other comics and the stentorian tones of tuxedoed announcers. NBC had actually approached literary humorist Irvin S. Cobb prior to contacting Benny, but Cobb's salary demands were too high. Executives probably noted the affinities Benny's stage act had with oral presentation. Benny produced most of his humor through low-key language and smooth, superbly timed delivery of his lines. He was not a primarily physical or visual comedian getting laughs through broad facial expressions, costume, or slapstick body movements. Benny engaged in quiet, intimate joking, confiding in the audience as if it were a small group, similar to the methods of the crooning singers like Bing Crosby and Rudy Valley, who were becoming popular through radio appearances. On the other hand, Benny's droll stare at the stage audience with hand to his cheek, which silently communicated his frustration and won viewers' sympathy, would be lost on radio listeners. It would only re-emerge in the early 1950s to embellish his comedy routines on television. Challenges of the Initial Canada Dry Program As Benny began the twice-weekly broadcasts of Canada Dry's new musical comedy radio show in May 1932, it seemed that not only he, but the sponsor, ad agency, and network were almost shockingly naive about how much labor Benny's role might entail. The orchestra and vocalist had large musical catalogs from which they could draw new tunes to perform. But if Benny was to do more than introduce the title of the next song, he was going to need fresh material every episode. Apparently, no provisions were in the original plans for the program to hire writers. The executives must have assumed Benny ad-libbed or wrote his own humorous asides. As a popular MC, Benny had experience in creating short gags and exchanges with vaudeville performers, but he was used to repeating similar patter for different audiences the whole week of the engagement, either getting new performers to work with or a new city to play in the following week. No one involved with the Canada Dry program had entirely thought through how a twice-weekly show with the same performers and the same audience might work. The first live episode demonstrated the promise and the drawback of the concept. In seven short monologues interspersed between the songs, Benny presented himself as a suave, urban, and thoroughly Americanized fellow who is witty and personable, a wisecracker who is self-centered but who self-deprecatingly understood that his attempts at boastful egotism would end in mild humiliation. Benny exchanged a little banter with orchestra leader George Olson and singer Ethel Chute as he introduced them. Nervous awkwardness of the new endeavor was apparent in Benny's doing most of the talking and their very brief responses to standard vaudeville jokes, such as ribbing the age of Olson's automobile. Benny worked from a script. He wanted a written structure to guide him to make sure he was organized and that the jokes could be carefully poured over and crafted into polished gems. He delivered his lines, though, in such an easy, nonchalant manner that listeners may have thought he was speaking off the cuff. Studies of Benny's career usually point out the assertive way that, even in this first episode, he wove the middle of the program advertising messages into his monologues, entwining a playful and fairly unusual mocking tone toward the product in the same way he told self-deprecating stories about himself. Benny's introductory monologue was probably drawn from when he played at the palace, but with the added twist of a backhanded plugging of the sponsor's product.
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Benny talking and making my first appearance on the air professionally. By that, I mean I am finally getting paid, which will be a great relief to my creditors. I really don't know why I am here. I'm supposed to be a sort of master of ceremonies and tell you all about the things that will happen, which would happen anyway. I must introduce the different artists who could easily introduce themselves and also talk about Canada Dry made to order by the glass, which is a waste of time as you know all about it. You drink it, like it, and don't want to hear about it. So ladies and gentlemen, a master of ceremonies is really a fellow who is unemployed and gets paid for it. In the second and third episodes of the Canada Dry program, with a dash of desperation, Benny provided brief descriptions of his fellow radio performers that again drew on the standard vaudeville insult humor patter. George Olson was penurious. Ethel Chute lied about her age. The boys in the band were drunkards. And announcer Ed Thorgerson resembled a Hollywood playboy with slicked back hair and a thin mustache. It looked like he'd swallowed all of Mickey Mouse but the tail, Benny quipped but the others were given few lines to speak. Benny appealed to his unseen listeners directly, asking if there was anybody out there, and reintroduced himself halfway through the show. In the second week, he opened the program with, Hello, somebody, this is Jack Benny talking. There will be a slight pause while you say, What of it? After all, I know your feelings, folks. I used to listen in myself. He closed with, That was our last number of our fourth program on the 11th of May. Are you still conscious? Hmm? Variety's reviewer in May 1932 sensed Benny's nervousness, but tried to be encouraging, noting there's no reason why a clever, intimate comedian of Benny's type shouldn't hit over the air. Essentially, he has everything it takes, from an excellent speaking voice to the right kind of delivery. Nevertheless, the reviewer was unenthusiastic about the integration Benny was trying to bring to the separate elements of music, comedy, and advertising in the show, recommending that Olson should leave all the talking to Benny. The comic advertising was also disturbing. Plug angle was considerably overdone here, with Benny handling it throughout. He pulled some pretty obvious puns such as drinking Canada dry. Right now the subtle spotting of the plug should be handled with silk gloves. Billboard's review of the program noted that Benny's nonchalant style of humor and delivery was different from what other comics were offering on air. A taste for his style has to be acquired, cautioned the reviewer, who also noticed the reliance on old vaudeville patter. On this particular program, he rang in some of his old material, but no doubt new to radio fans. Years later, Jack Benny confessed his panic. In vaudeville, you had one show and that was it. You changed it whenever you felt like. And in this, when you realized that every week you needed a new show, this got a little bit frightening. In another interview, he recalled, I didn't have any idea how important it was to have good material and how hard it was to get. The first show was a cinch. I used about half of all the gags I knew. The second show consumed all the rest. And I faced the third absolutely dry. Established performers appearing on the airwaves similarly expressed terror at the speed with which the live broadcasts to huge audiences consumed a career's worth of material in just a few hours. The scourge of the amusement field is radio, warned Variety. Radio is devouring too much music, eating up the stage too cannibalistically, and burning out all talent too fast, so that it may undo itself about as rapidly as it made itself prominent in its relation to the masses. Edwin complained that the gags used in four half-hour radio programs would provide enough material for a full-length Broadway play. While Variety acknowledged that radio had made nationally known stars of niche performers like Wynn and Jack Pearl, as well as previous unknowns like Gosden and Carell, it cautioned, The very biggest on the ether today soon become boresome simply because it's not showmanly to dish up a new act 52 times a year. Comics used to be able to test out their new routines in smaller towns like Plainfield and Union City. Now can kill their careers with a bad routine in front of 20 to 50 million listeners in one night. Performers and program producers struggled to adapt old business models to this new mode of communication. The radio networks had consolidated the breadth of the vaudeville system into just a few broadcast outlets to serve a nationwide audience. The networks demanded that broadcasts be live each week. Program producers could not use previously recorded performances or reruns, options that might have made the search for fresh material, the pressure to perform at peak ability, and the chase for high ratings less fearsome. During his years in vaudeville, Benny had regularly enhanced his routine by purchasing jokes and routines from gag writers such as Al Bosberg. 
Dave Friedman, Sid Silvers, and Harry Kahn. He turned to them now. In the 1920s, Burns and Allen had paid Boesberg a continuous 10% of their $1,750 weekly vaudeville salary in exchange for his creation of individual routines, such as lamb chops, which they performed for years. The duo asked him to write material for their weekly radio broadcasts on the Robert Burns Cigar Program. But Boesberg balked at how much more work was involved in creating the seven to eight minutes of new material they required each week for only 10% of their $1,000 radio salary. Boesberg quit and moved to Hollywood to take film writing jobs. Burns and Allen and the radio producers soon assembled a staff of five writers to churn out all the necessary material. Dave Friedman devised an alternate method to address radio comics' endless need for material. Eddie Cantor was one of his major clients. Friedman hired a staff of young assistants who combed through every source of humor in the library, joke books, magazine articles, and 19th century literature, to cull every possible jest, quip, and comic exchange. They organized these jokes into vast files on every conceivable topic that Friedman could then dip into, rearrange a few particulars, and assemble into scripts churned out for half a dozen different radio comedy shows each week. By the end of the second week, Benny sought out Harry Kahn, a tap-dancing former vaudevillian who had turned to full-time writing, penning routines for dozens of comedians and for Mae West's Broadway shows in the 1920s. In the spring of 1932, Kahn was working on the Burns and Allen staff. Benny decided to rely solely on Kahn, paying Kahn's salary out of his own pocket. The two quickly became partners, working closely together week in and week out to create, edit, and perfect the dialogue. To Kahn's chagrin, the radio network would not allow writers to get on-air credit, however, so Benny always remained the focus of public and critical acclaim. Benny was as financially generous with Kahn as he was dependent on him, paying Kahn one of the highest salaries earned by a radio writer. By the end of the third week on the air, with Kahn on board, the Canada Dry program scripts started to become more adventurous. George Olson now was given more straight lines as he and Benny engaged in conversation. Everyone else in the studio, from orchestra members and Kahn to Benny's personal assistant, Harry Baldwin, was pulled to the mic to voice fictional guests in brief one-time appearances. Benny and Kahn began experimenting with creating a richer fictional world for the program, creating sketch routines that briefly moved away Away from the microphone. On May 23, 1932, they finessed the problem of sagging by endowing announcer Ed Thorgerson with a magical ability to tune an on-air radio into a conversation made by the characters at a soda fountain located in the building's lobby. At mid-show, Thorgerson asked where Jack was, and band member Bob Rice responded that he'd just left. Ed, but who's going to take charge of the program? Bob. I don't know. Ed, I think I'll tune in the soda fountain to see what's going on there. Ad-lib tuning noises and fade out. Fade in. Scene at soda fountain. Sound effects. Clink of glasses. Fizzes of charged water. Babble of voices requesting drinks, etc. Alan. And I'll have a chocolate malted milk. Ethel. Make mine a made-to-order Canada Dry. Fran. There you are, and what'll you have, sir? Band member Fran Frey played the soda jerk. Jack. Give me two nickels. I want a telephone. Fran. Say, this is a soda fountain. Jack. I'll have a glass of Canada Dry Ginger Ale made to order by the glass at all soda fountains. Fran. Do you know the chorus, mister? Jack. Oh, I see. Now just give me a glass of Canada Dry. Fran. Would you like a little flavor in it, sir? Say a little cherry? Jack. No, no, just plain Canada Dry. Fran. How about putting some ice cream in it? It's swell with ice cream. Jack. Yes, I imagine it is very good, but if you don't mind, I'll have just the plain Canada Dry, see? Fran. Would you like toast with it? Jack. No. Say, were you ever a barber? Fran. Who wants to know? Jack. Jack Benny. Fran. Are you Jack Benny? Jack. Yes, yes. Fran. The Jack Benny who broadcasts for Canada Dry? Jack. Yes. Fran. Every Monday and Wednesday? Jack, yes. Fran, and if you ask me if I was ever a barber, gee, that's hot. Jack, will you please give me a glass of... Ethel enters and interrupts. Ethel, oh, Jack. Jack, hello, Ethel. Ethel, you'd better hurry back. George is getting ready to play a number.
Jack, come on, let's have a drink first. Ethel, no thanks, I don't want... Jack, come on, Ethel, I'll pay for mine. Ethel laughs at this. Jack, oh, I'm only kidding. Come on, Ethel, I'll buy them. Hey, give us two Canada Dries and make mine large. Fran, okay, say, do you want a piece of cake with it? Jack, come here, lean over a minute. Sound effect, crash of plate. And now give us two glasses of Canada Dry. Sound effect, fizzes of charged water. Ethel, what's he doing? Jack, that's the way you make it. First, put just the right amount of syrup in, then add the charged water, and there you are. Well, here it is, Ethel, good luck. Ethel and Benny singing, How Canada Dry I Am, How Canada Dry I Am. They both start to laugh. Fade in. Piano music. Opening bars of the song Tender Child. Ethel. What's that? Jack. Say, that's George beginning to play the next number. Ethel. Gee, I'd better run back. I have to sing it with Fran. The show staff created sound effects of glasses clinking and ginger ale fizzing. The scene may have only lasted two minutes, but when Benny returned to the studio after the next song, he jokingly assumed that he had to explain to the audience what they had done. Well, folks, this is Jack Benny back at the studio. Well, to tell you the truth, we never even left here. Olson's bass drum was the counter, and the fizz you heard was one of the boys sneezing. Subsequent episodes contained a three- to five-minute sketch occurring in a fictional place away from the immediacy of the studio space. Some involved Jack traveling to a special event and reporting on it, essentially performing a monologue. Jack attended the Dempsey Sharkey Prize fight at Madison Square Garden and parodied radio sports coverage, giving play-by-play -play action. Another time, Jack and George Olson were arrested for speeding and broadcast the program from jail. And on July 6, the cast visited the zoo and gathered testimonials from the animals about how much they enjoy drinking Canada Dry. Meanwhile, Jack continued to rib George Olson about being a spendthrift. Back at the soda fountain, George offered to treat Jack to a glass of ginger ale, but had forgotten his wallet. So Jack ended up picking up the check for the entire orchestra's order. This chapter and this whole book continues on Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes or at thisdaybenny.com. And thank you. Thank you.